I think that's important, yes. To, to, to all of you. And, I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes. and there goes the special effects man from Plan 9 from Outer Space. <laughs> Welcome to the panel we didn't even know we were doing. Hmm. <laughs> but it's not the first time we have been in this. It is, however, the first time that we have had our crotches underlit by Adam Savage. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, what you're seeing over there is shining right up here. Hmm. This is a first. You were here, you're witnesses. So welcome to the, I guess what they're calling it is the ElfQuest past, present, and future panel, which what more can we say? Um, this is the first major convention that we've been to since the outbreak of COVID back in March of last year. Um, it is wonderful and it is a little strange. Um, we don't know if you folks have been to conventions before now, or maybe I should ask, uh, is this your first convention in a while? Yeah. Um, and you're here to see us. My God, no pressure. <laughs> How many of you here haven't read ElfQuest? Show of hands. Well, we've got a couple. I um, love newbies. <laughs> I was going to start reading it last night, but uh, then I fell asleep. Sorry. That's a good excuse. We won't take it personally. <laughs> um, most of you know, all of you know, almost all of you know that ElfQuest is uh, a series of comics and graphic novels that Wendy and I, mostly Wendy, have been creating and producing since 1978. So that, by my math, is 43 years. ElfQuest is older than some of you. And we, with very few exceptions, have not um, stopped producing ElfQuest in all of that time. Uh, a lot of folks come up and say, you know, I used to read ElfQuest. I used to read ElfQuest in the 1980s. I discovered ElfQuest when Marvel started reprinting it in 1985. The past tense is always amusing and a little bit frustrating because we have never stopped. We always think of ElfQuest in the present tense because the characters live in our minds in the moment and what's happening to them is always there for us to think about and plan. And um, so we enjoy very much when people come up to us and say, oh, ElfQuest got me started in comics back in the early 80s. That's that's one of our favorite things to hear, and, and above and beyond that, if someone says, I learned how to read from ElfQuest, that's a very, very special honor to us. Um, we love it when uh, hearing challenged people tell us that ElfQuest helped them to learn to read because the pictures, along with the words, help them to understand the words. Um, there were so many ways that ElfQuest, we have been told by our very generous and kind readers, there are so many ways that ElfQuest has touched people in different ways. And that's one of the things that has kept us going for over 40 years, because over 40 years is a heck of a long time. So, so the motivation to keep telling the story has a lot to do with uh, this, this sort of co-creation we've had with you, our readers, and how much you care about the characters, and let us know that all through the years. You know, at, at some point, 
Of course, we're going to open this up to your questions. Um, we know one question that somebody in here is going to ask. And we, we've got a little side bet going on as to uh, when it will happen. Um, the thing about ElfQuest is you all know it as a series of comics and graphic novels. Because that's mostly, in fact, no, not exclusively, um, mostly how it has been presented for all of these years. The thing about doing a series, a long-running, ongoing series of comics and graphic novels, is you get a lot of people who are also uh, in the comics business. A lot of fans come up to us and say, what are your, aside from ElfQuest, of course, what are your favorite comics to read? And that's always a tough one for us because here's a little something that you may not know. We never intended to make comics. ElfQuest is a 43 year, I'll say detour because I don't want to say mistake. <laughs> um, but you see, Wendy, never intended to be a comic book artist. Uh, what did you really want to do with your life? Well, as, uh, as a preteen, I was really, really into animation, and I, I thought of myself uh, as going on to become an animator and a cartoonist. I just loved cartoons, full-length features, shorts, anything I could watch. And so that informed my artwork a lot growing up. When I, when I was in my mid-teens, I discovered Marvel Comics, in particular the Fantastic Four and the Avengers. And I got very, very excited about the way those were drawn, particularly by the work of Jack Kirby, which began to be a real influence on my work. From Jack, I learned how to draw strong characters that had weight and structure. And I was also, at that time, introduced to anime and manga. There was only a very little of it in America at the time. In the mid-60s, you could watch, perhaps, Astro Boy. Anybody ever seen Astro Boy? And Kimba the White Lion, you might remember Kimba. Uh, you could find them on odd TV channels, but not very often, and, and manga were almost impossible to find unless you went to San Francisco and went to Japantown. Um, otherwise, you had to kind of rely on other people that you met in fandom to help you connect and get the materials. So as the years went on, that's what I did. I got more and more involved with fandom. I started showing my work at art shows, and I even began to work professionally as a fantasy illustrator, I worked for um, Jim Bain on uh, Galaxy and If ma magazines. They were uh, science fiction anthologies. And uh, I, started, I started an actual professional career in the early 70s as a fantasy and science fiction illustrator. And yet, as, a, as someone who has always loved to tell stories, I was forever sketching these little characters Sometimes they were little insect people with wings. Sometimes they were fairies. Very often they were elves. So come 1977, there was this explosion of wonderfulness in the form of Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. And, and there, was, there was just this explosion of interest in fantasy and science fiction that had never happened before. And so I sent Richard down. And I told him this idea that I had had percolating for years and years. And it just all seemed to be the right time for it. It seemed like if we were ever going to have a chance to tell this story to people, now would be the time because people would be receptive. So, 1977, we started thinking about how are we going to do this? And that's why Richard brought up that I never intended to be a comic artist because comics was almost the last thing we thought about in a way to tell this story. We were both 
fans of comics from our teen years. Um, speaking for myself, I was a Marvel zombie long before that term ever became a thing. I would go to the drugstore every Tuesday or Wednesday and the guy got to know me. He let me clip the wire on the packets of comic books and I got to pick the one that had the best staples and all of that stuff. Um, we, we were both very much... How many of you know how we met? A couple. So how many of you don't know how Wendy and I met? <laughs> All right, this, I mean, we've got time. We've got... I know, but you're not going to believe this. Just... Um, this. This also feeds into the Y Comics. We were both fans of comics, particularly Marvel Comics. Wendy said Fantastic Four and the Avengers because those were group comics, but they were, they were family. The Fantastic Four was a family. The Avengers was a kind of family, and you know, what family doesn't have its little ups and downs? Um, we both read the same kinds of things. Now, the only fly in that ointment was that in the late 1960s, Wendy was living near San Francisco where she grew up, and I was going to school in Boston. Now, that's about as far away on the continental United States as two people can get. One January day in 1969, I went back to my college dorm room with the comics that I had gotten, among which was Silver Surfer, issue number five. This was the original first incarnation of the Silver Surfer comic when it was good. <laughs> um, <laughs> opinionated, mwah! Uh, and they don't do it anymore, but way back in the day, there used to be things called letter columns. And you could write in, send it with a stamp, and it would, you know, if you were lucky, your letter got printed. And not only did your letter get printed, but your name got printed and your address got printed. Those were different times. So in the letter column of Silver Surfer number five, there was, among all of the other, uh, stuff, a letter that, that, that was kind of philosophical and talked about how uh, Silver Surfer w must be, you know, getting really, really unhappy and tired of, beaten, of being beaten up by humans all the time because he was this alien stranger in a strange land character and everywhere he went he was the object of fear and paranoia and the letter writer said, you know, humans are better than that. Humans can be nice. And I got to the end of it, and the writer was Wendy Fletcher, and I thought two things. One, that's a really different, thoughtful kind of letter, and the other thing was, that's a girl's name. <laughs> now, in 1969, in all the world, there were three girls who read comics. <laughs> And here was one of them, and I had an address. So I did what any self-respecting freshman at an all-male school would do. I wrote a letter. He has ne neglected to mention that that all-male school was MIT hmm. in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, that's a rather well-known... Uh, Trade school, I think Sheldon. Trade school. <laughs> so I started getting dozens of letters from guys all over the U.S. and Canada who wanted to meet a girl who read comics. It was the original unicorn. Yeah, yeah. And they told me what color their eyes were and how many pimples they had and generally just TMI all over the place. But one letter with, an, with the return address of MIT which my mother saw and said, open that one. <laughs> this letter said, I really, really liked what you had to say in your letter that was printed in the Silver Surfer number five, but if you want to know more about me, you have to write me, and I promise you surprises await. Now that's a good bit of dating <laughs> advice, because it intrigued me. 
of all the letters I got from guys who wanted to meet a girl who read comics, he was the only one who said, no, you got to do something. So I wrote him and included in the letter I sent him, I sent him a drawing. She drew me a, a, a drawing in that letter, and it blew my little freshman mind because, to my eyes at the time, it was as good as anything I was reading in the comics. And so I thought, my God, not only female, but talented as all get out. Well, this began a four-year cross-country correspondence, and we finally decided it was a lot more efficient, cheaper, just to get married, so we did that. 1972, and we consolidated our comic book collections, and we <laughs> we reveled in our mutual Marvel mania. But that's why, when in 1977, when Star Wars hit, and suddenly, my God, science fiction and fantasy that you used to be looked down upon if you read was making hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars, and that makes it really, really mainstream. We thought, well, Wendy has been a storyteller all her life, as she said, um, and she's got this wonderful idea for a tribe of elfin characters. How do we get it out there? And we thought, well, you know, we can write it in prose, make a novel out of it, but then her wonderful, delicious drawings, you wouldn't ever see them. It would be just all words. We had had the insane idea of, let's do a, a, an animated cartoon about it. And I said, okay, we're two people, we're living in a one bedroom apartment in, in East Overshoe, Massachusetts. And uh, these things do take money, so. But I think it was Will Eisner who d described comics as the perfect melding of words and pictures. And since we were both fans of comics anyway, why not try comics? And so that's what we did. And we decided, all right, we will, we will uh, write and draw this thing. I have to say the gods were with us because the, the amount of synchronicity and serendipity that we had access to at the time could never, you could never catch lightning in a bottle like that again. We were a couple of complete noobs to publishing. We, we, in fact, we didn't want to. We took ElfQuest to Marvel, we took it to DC, a couple of other places, and these established mainstream companies, their, their opinion of ElfQuest was, well, this is just too peculiar. It doesn't look like anything we've ever seen before, so we can't see how we could do anything with it commercially. Uh, peculiar. Peculiar got attached to ElfQuest a lot in those days. <laughs> Anime and manga was only just beginning to uh, get into the awareness of the public consciousness, and uh, ElfQuest looked like manga, and, and it was a drawing style that was very hard for mainstream people to understand. So, what, would, what did we do then? We really wanted this thing to come out. And as Wendy said, Marvel said no, DC said no, a couple of the larger uh, independent comics uh, companies said no. So, like the fable of the little red hen, we said, all right, we're just gonna have to do this ourselves. And speaking personally, I had to learn about printers, I had to learn about distribution, I had to learn about bookkeeping, I had to learn about, you know, all the technical things that um, they go with printing. Wendy had already gotten some experience in drawing comics, uh, you know, page layouts and panel-to-panel -panel progression, uh, because she had actually submitted some comics ideas to Marvel a few years mm -hmm. earlier, and they were very impressed, but they wisely said, you know, finish, finish your education, put a few more years under your belt. Um, so anyway, uh, we, we just taught ourselves, we learned by doing, 
We made every mistake in the book. We did everything that it was possible to do that was different from comics. Comics were color, ours was black and white. Comics were 12 cents, ours was a dollar. Comics were comic book sized, ours was magazine sized. Comics came out monthly, ours came out three times a year, so you waited four months in between issues. And comics were drawn by men, and this was drawn by a woman. Ooh. <laughs> um, but her style was, the, the, there was something really, really uh, uh, addictive about her art style, and there still is. Uh, one other word that, you know, peculiar got attached to, to ElfQuest. The other uh, uh, label that has dogged ElfQuest throughout its lifetime is cute. Uh, because Wendy's, and, and I'm going to stop, it's, it's not going to cover my nose, I'm sorry. It just keeps falling off, you've seen it, I'm trying to do this, it's like a wedgie in reverse. Forget about it. We're up here, we're at least six feet away, and we've been vaccinated, so. Um, cute, and, 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 and cute is such a, an easy, lazy categorization. It's also a little bit of a put down, but cute is the last thing. Talk about cute in the, in the Tezuka sense. How many of you are familiar with Osamu Tezuka's work? Do you know you know the name? He is the creator of Astro Boy and Kimba the White Lion. And for those of you who have are familiar with his drawing style, he he himself was highly influenced by Disney cartoons back in the 60s, and he is considered the Walt Disney of Japan. Well, Tezuka's anime was the first anime I was ever exposed to, and I became a child of Tezuka because this guy's storytelling, if, if you read Tezuka's manga, yes, the characters look very childlike, they have big feet and big eyes, and they look like little children, but what he puts his characters through, <laughs> Tezuka's a cruel god. So, so this, this style of storytelling really impressed me because drawing a reader in by drawing characters that have, does anybody know the word neoteny? Have you ever heard that before? You know that word? What does it mean? It's something that looks like or has childlike characteristics. Yeah, for those of you who couldn't hear that, neoteny means childlike characteristics, especially childlike proportions, light, large eyes, small face, small nose, you know, everything that fits the elves. So you design characters with neotenic qualities that make them look